Uh, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, so, I, so I have a, a fairly broad mandate here, which I, I think is actually much broader than my specific uh, domain of expertise. Uh, a lot of the work that I tend to do is on downstream analytical, uh, analytics of large-scale sequencing data. Uh, but it's been good. I, I'm glad, in a sense, that I was assigned this task because it has given me a chance to interact with a, with a whole lot of other people uh, who spend a lot of time thinking about upstream processing of sequence data and, and other types of complex data sets. And I just wanted to acknowledge up front that uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about today has derived from conversations with the, uh, the people up here on, on the slide, and uh, particularly to acknowledge the very fruitful discussions over the last few years with the Thousand Genomes Analysis Group, uh, which is, has really shaped my view of how we deal with large heterogeneous uh, sequencing data sets. So, so here we have, this, this was the plausible uh, near future scenario that I considered as I, as I started to, to think about the challenges of uh, aggregating sequence data from an informatic perspective. So, so let's imagine that we have exome sequence data. Uh, it could easily be whole genome data, uh, sequence data instead. Uh, we also have complex phenotype data, and these are available for 100,000 individuals derived from multiple different sources. And now, currently that would uh, comprise approximately a petabyte of raw data, which is a, a vast amount of data. I'll, I'll give you some numbers in a second. And at the, at the moment, at least, the, the vast majority of that data, in fact, almost all of it, would, would be the raw sequence data. So phenotype data, while it takes a lot longer to collect uh, and is, is much more difficult to do so, actually constitutes a very tiny fraction of the overall data that would, uh, that would be uh, possessed for these individuals. Although one of the points that I'll try to make later is that as we move forward into longitudinal uh, sampling of, of things like, for instance, RNA sequencing data over time, or other uh, deep longitudinal measurements of patients over time, the proportion of these data that will end up being phenotype versus sequence data will, will increase. So, so the goals of, uh, in, in this context, I, I think, would be firstly to create accurate and consistent variant calls uh, that, that are consistent across all of the samples within this set, regardless of which source they came from. Uh, secondly, to uh, harmonise and clean the phenotype data, which of course is very difficult. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, to make sure that the data are not just accessible to the community, but are actually usable. So that many different people, not just statistical geneticists, but biologists and people from pharmaceutical companies can actually, access the, can actually use these data to address their specific biological questions. So the, the four areas of, of key challenges that, that I saw emerging from this were, sorry, just realized I'm progressing in two different places. The, the four key challenges uh, that, I, that I think arise in this area are, are firstly in the area of logistics, and this is basically just around moving, storing, and processing very large data sets. Secondly, very importantly, harmonization, so how we actually pull together data from different sources and, and make it consistent across, across an entire cohort. Thirdly, analytical challenges, which, are, which have been addressed, I think, by, by other speakers very well, so I won't spend much, much time on that. Uh, and finally, and crucially, uh, issues associated with access and usability of, of the data. Okay, so in terms of the first, the first series of logistical challenges relate to data management. Um, so, so here we have a, a petabyte of raw data, and one of, one of the first things that we will want to do with that data, of course, is move it from one place to another. And that turns out to actually be, be uh, extremely difficult. So even in the era where uh, generating 100,000 exomes is no longer inconceivable, actually moving that data is pretty tough, even with a, a very high bandwidth connection, a 10 gigabit connection, uh, such as the one that we use at the Broad for, for moving data around. Shifting 100,000 exomes would take on the order of one to six months, uh, depending, on, depending on exactly how you do that. And in, in fact, uh, interestingly, it may actually be more uh, time effective to simply fill a truck full of hard drives, one terabyte hard drives, drive that to the facility, pay someone to sit there and download the data into those hard drives, load the truck back up and drive it back to wherever you, you need to have it delivered. So it's sort of, sort of ironic that we're living in this high-tech world and yet delivery of data by road is, is, is more cost effective. The, uh, data, data storage is not free. Uh, I, I got uh, different numbers and different estimates of exactly how much it costs to store these data. It depends on whether they need to be access accessible from high performance disks, but it, it could cost uh, up to a million dollars a year to keep uh, 100,000 exomes. Th these numbers will be roughly tenfold higher for whole genome sequence data uh, on, on average. Uh, importantly, though, we can actually drop these numbers substantially by applying different compression algorithms, and I'll, I'll go through one, one such algorithm later. Now, importantly, although these numbers are daunting, the, the community now has very extensive experience in handling large data sets, not quite on this scale, but certainly in the tens of thousands of, of exomes. 
uh, all of these logistical problems are, are soluble. I think they're, they're eminently soluble, and most of them don't actually require developing fundamentally new methods. The second set of logistical challenges relates to uh, QC and metadata. Uh, one issue, of course, is, is keeping track of samples, so making sure that the, sam the sample data you load at, at one end of the, uh, the truck that you've driven across the country uh, is the same sample when you reach the other end. Uh, for, for genetic data, in many ways, this is easier because, we, because it is inherently uh, identifiable in a sense. It's r relatively easy to spot sample swaps, duplicates, uh, pedigree errors, and these types of things. Uh, but, but some errors will remain invisible to genetic data. And of course, uh, keeping track of phenotype data and ensuring that it's linked to the correct set of gen genetic data will require incredibly stringent uh, quality control and, and sample tracking across that whole chain. There's, there's also additional metadata, non-phenotypic metadata, that needs to be caref very carefully kept track of. For instance, we need to make sure we know exactly what each participant has consented their data to be used for, so that uh, if in, in this sort of vast aggregated uh, theoretical data set, the data are not accidentally used in ways that are not appropriate given the consent. Uh, we need to know, in the, in the case that, that we need to do high throughput validation or look for biological, do biological follow-up, we need to know exactly where the samples for those individuals are, and of course we need to know whether they can be recontacted for phenotyping, and if so, how. And as I mentioned earlier, phenotype data is likely to massively increase in the near future, so that will become a, a, an increasingly larger fraction of the data, the informatics burden. Now, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about harmonisation, particularly in the, in the sequence space. The, the key, the need for harmonisation is driven by the fact that both sequence and phenotype data are, uh, for various reasons, some of which are sane and, and others of which are not, uh, these, these data are gen in generated inconsistently between studies. And this lack of consistency really hampers and in some cases actually destroys our ability to draw useful conclusions across uh, various studies. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, as Chris O'Donnell mentioned, uh, it's very difficult to approach phenotype harmonisation uh, using current methods. And as we start to aggregate larger and larger numbers of studies together, that will become an increasing bottleneck. And it seems to me uh, that the, the, the current approach may end up not being scalable to, to very large uh, aggregated, aggregated data sets. So approaches based on machine learning or, uh, may, may end up having to move in. And while those will be noisier, that may be the only way in which we can actually pull these phenotypes together. Now, fortunately, harmonization is much more tractable when it comes to the uh, sequence data. But the key thing here is that in order to make uh, in order for harmonisation to occur for sequence data, data processing and variant calling has to be done in a centralised way. So, we, we're, so long as we live in a world where sequence, uh, where genotypes are called at various different facilities and then pulled together, it will be effectively impossible for us to harmonise that data. And, and the reason for this is, uh, is shown in this, in this animation here. Let's say we have a data from, from one study here where our variant positions are shown as rows and individuals as columns. Uh, these are the sites where each of the individuals is variant across this, uh, this region of the genome. And, and here, just in this column I've shown, uh, in black are the sites that are variant within this, this particular study. Now, if we then draw in a, a set of individuals from a separate study, uh, there are certain sites which are variable in both of the populations, and in, in many cases we can actually draw some conclusions across the studies for those sites. But there are also a number of sites that are seen in one study but not in another. And there are a number of different possible explanations there. Uh, for instance, we may, uh, if this is exome sequence data, it may well be that that particular exon of that site was just not covered in one study but was covered in the other. So there's missing data. We, but the, uh, given the way that variant calls are currently stored, it's actually very difficult to extract that information. In some cases, we'll see a false positive in one study but not in another. And in other cases, there'll be a false negative in one study but not the other. The, the only way in which we can resolve these issues is to, is to pull the, the samples together at the raw data stage and actually recall, reprocess and recall the variants in a, in a combined fashion. And that then allows us to say, uh, to determine precisely which sites are actually not called in, in, some, in one study but not the other. Where uh, It allows us to find new variants by sharing information across uh, those studies to find sites that are actually variable but weren't called in the initial analyses. And it also allows us, in some cases, to, to identify false positives. So, so in this case, what, what happens is by sharing information across all of the samples together, we can, we can reduce the evidence for a false positive site in one of those studies. Now, uh, here I'm showing the, uh, the pip uh, pipeline for data sequence data processing that's currently used at the Broad. Uh, many other centres' pipelines can also be shown. I, I apologise, this is the sort of standard, overly complicated uh, processing pipeline. 
But the key, the key features here are that firstly, there is a, a step that uh, we go through on a, on a per sample level where data are, are, are called, are basically processed, analyzed, and, and recalibrated. And then crucially, there's a step in the middle here, the variant calling step, where we actually batch together a whole large number of samples between one and n, n samples, where n can be arbitrarily large, as I'll show in a second. And, and the variant, variant calling is then done by sharing in information among all of these samples together. Uh, and that then allows us to, to get much more powerful estimates of, um, of which sites are variant, and also to rule out particular error modes. And then finally, in, in the third phase of the pipeline, we integrate together uh, all of the, the uh, variants called from each of these individuals with external sources of data, recalibrate the variants, and that then gives us our, our final uh, data set of sequence variants. So it, it's, it's critical that this, this step here is actually done on many different samples together. The standard approach now at the Broad is to do uh, this variant calling on 100 samples in, in one batch. But uh, one of the questions that we've been asking over the last six months is, is whether this can be extended to much larger sample sets. And so the, uh, the only way in which this can be done is by reducing the amount of information that's present in each sample. And here you can see uh, for, a, for a, a, a high coverage genome sequence data, this is a, a read file. So each of these orange horizontal lines is actually an individual read uh, piled up across a region of the genome. Now in most regions of the genome, say this region here, uh, this individual appears to be homozygous for the reference sequence at, at all of the regions across here. And, and we can actually relatively confidently say this is a well-behaved region, this individual's homozygous reference and just collapse that region down into a single read that contains some quality information, but basically it loses, it discards a lot of the information, redundant information that's carried here. And, th and then what's kept are only the reads that pile up around these variable positions where we see evidence for a heterozygous variant or perhaps some more complex variant that's present in that individual. <coughs> but by discarding this information, it's actually possible to compress the raw data by uh, an order of somewhere between 20 and 100 times. And that then makes it possible to scale variant calling across m much larger numbers of samples. So uh, as, a, as a pilot analysis, a proof of principle of uh, scaling this type of analysis up, uh, I've been working with uh, Mark DePristo and uh, Carly Shakir on a, a pilot test just looking at chromosome one, so about 10% of the genome, in 16,500 exomes. And these exomes are derived from a number of different studies, uh, including 1,000 genomes, and then a series of disease-specific um, studies and, and also healthy controls from each of those studies. Uh, and I, I've cited some of the, the PIs involved in this, in this project here. So for these 16,500 exomes, uh, all of the data has been pulled together, aggregated, recalibrated jointly, and then variant calling has been, has been run across the whole set. Uh, functional annotation has been performed using a, a pipeline developed in my group. Um, I, won't, I won't present uh, the data on that in this presentation, though. The preliminary results, uh, firstly, and most importantly, I think, just generate that this is feasible. Uh, the, the analysis on 16,500 exomes worked for chromosome 1, and therefore will work across the rest of the genome. It took just under a week to run using relatively modest uh, computational uh, power, at least by broad standards. Uh, modest, of course, is, is a relative term. So, this, uh, so, so that means that scaling this approach up to a whole genome level and to, many, to much larger numbers of samples is, is entirely uh, feasible. In terms of looking at it on a larger scale, uh, we're currently preparing for exome-wide calling in 20,000 individuals, so adding in a few more thousand individuals from other studies. And that will be followed by large-scale validation and the designing of, uh, of cheap genotyping arrays, in this case, to target uh, loss of function variants that are identified in these 20,000 genomes, which, uh, I, again, I won't talk about more, but ties into uh, Francis Collins' idea of a, of a human knockout project. The key, the key points here are that there are no fundamental technical barriers to scaling this up to large numbers, although one challenge that we will face is the, the, the diversity of sequencing platforms may soon uh, increase. Uh, as, as uh, beyond the current Illumina platform. I, I realize I'm running low on time, actually, so I'll, I'll just very, skim through very briefly through the analytical challenges. Many of these have already been discussed by Peter Donnelly. Uh, he, he mentioned, and I think this is, is crucial to understand, that variant calling is still immature. Um, and I'll, I'll avoid the other, the other issues here, um, except to point out, as, again, as I mentioned earlier, that having very broad phenotype data will impose a major multiple testing burden that we'll need to take into account when designing studies. So a key challenge that I, I wanted to spend the last section of my talk focusing on is, is how we can actually provide useful access to these data. Excuse it's, me, you just you have one minute, Dan. Dan one minute, okay. So I will make this very quick. Uh, providing aggregated and harmonized variant calls will, of course, greatly empower statistical geneticists. But in terms of empowering the rest of the research community, we need to consider how we can 
uh, provide them with tools that allow them to tackle uh, typical use cases. So situations, so for instance, they may wish to know which missense or loss of function variants are found in their favorite genes, what phenotypes they're associated with, and of course, from a clinical perspective, which variants in, in, a, in a patient's genome, or indeed in their own genome uh, for, a, for a consumer, are actually associated with disease. And uh, I will actually just skip over this. Terry Manolio, Terry has circulated uh, some of the results from the meeting that was had earlier this month, where various different models for data access and, and aggregation uh, were presented. And I think uh, going through that document that, that has been circulated is, is, is very useful. There are many different models that could be provided, and uh, the, I think the solution here will be to use all of them, not just one. So uh, the key messages then in my final 15 seconds uh, that are a very large-scale aggregation of sequence and phenotype data is, is entirely tractable from a log logistical perspective. It will require centralised processing and variant calling, uh, but, but this is, is certainly doable. The amount of phenotype data on samples will increase massively as we start moving into a much more complex <coughs> longitudinal phenotyping, and harmonisation, of course, will be much more challenging there than it is for sequence data. I mentioned the curse of multiple testing, and finally, the need for substantial investment in new interfaces to uh, maximise the impact of aggregating this sort of data on the broader biomedical community. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, comments and questions for Daniel? How many, how many times does a genome have to be squared before you can say that you sort of know what there is in there or not, or do you ever know? I, I don't think you ever know for sure. Uh, so even... Um, but in particular for more exotic variants, so very complex regions where you have multiple different rearrangements nested within each other. Uh, at the moment, there's, there's no method that will actually detect those. And the, um, it, it's, it's likely that over the next three to six months or 12 months, we'll develop new methods for doing that. Um, I think we'll, at each stage, we'll just need to go back and revisit these samples and recall them over and over. W one of the challenges we'll be facing, of course, is that um, it means if we add, if we have N samples within our data set and we then need to add another 10, uh, in an ideal world, just to add those 10 and get the best variant calls possible for those 10 samples, we then need to recall the entire batch together. So uh, we've been discussing at Broad the idea of basically having a monthly recalling uh, of, of almost all of the exomes that are, that are held uh, in, the, in the Broad centre. And so that would then allow us to just continue recalling those samples and improving as each, as each new batch is added. But, but you must get data at some point of, on... There must be some exomes that just never change when you go th when they go through that process of, and, and at some point you can stop doing that. Possibly, that's right. It will be incremental and I think we'll probably reach a point where you're, you're close enough to reality that you can stop. Yeah, that's okay, fine. so we have a number of, of comments. So Maynard, Stephen, Thomas, Tricia, and Gail. Uh, no, it's an ex excellent presentation. I think you caught the right balance between sort of the alarmism that sometimes hovers around this area and Naivete. Uh, I mean, obviously there's some challenges, but they, do, they, they look solvable. And I, I would just say that uh, although I can certainly understand why at the moment this kind of centralized variant calling is, is essential, I'm more optimistic that, uh, that, that this is a transient phenomenon. There was a very similar situation in the, kind of the early days of, uh, let's say, Cosmet or back level assembly in which unless it was all done at one place you just got different results on the same back and so forth but those problems were solved and they, they it requires a, a collective activity in which you know multiple centers are exchanging uh, data sets and comparing their analyses but that that is i think the path forward we don't want to over centralize uh, anything here I, I think that's fair. It, it may well be that in one year or two years' time, uh, the procedures are sufficiently robust and, and set up that we can just distribute the code that's required to call variants, and that, that is then done systematically. Um, and, and of course, as the data quality improves, that will make a big difference as well. If we have long reads that reduce mapping errors and very accurate reads, that will reduce the impact of different processing pipelines on, on the final calls. And quickly identify, I believe, the, uh, you know, the key threat to that uh, evolution is uh, diversification of platforms, but the only comment I would make there is that uh, there, te there tends to be platform convergence for relatively long periods of time, 
just because it's so beneficial. It's not necessarily the, it's like the success of DAS. It's not necessarily the best product, uh, but that there's, there, there just are a lot of advantages for, you know, for many people using the same product, sure. and I, I think that'll happen here. I, I think you're right as well. I, I, I suspect we're just about to go through a period of disruption, but things will stabilize. Yeah. Sure, that was a wonderful presentation. I want to just follow up and ask you to speculate for a minute or so on and related to an issue that we've talked about last night and this morning, and that is sort of uh, exponential growth of the kinds of tests and the ways in which we'd want to look at a very large data set of whole genome with large number of uh, phenotypes and potentially doing sort of phenome scans as opposed to genome scans. How do you foresee the next two to three years in terms of the computational capabilities of doing that, or are they going to be so large, you know, and so cumbersome, as you just described, how, it, how much effort it took to do one chromosome one week, you know, a very distinguished group of people spending a lot of time converging on that, you know, at some point this is all going to be very trivial, but is that going to be five, ten, or fifteen years from now, and, and if we do these kinds of large-scale sequencing, there is a certain... Uh, degree of uh, of everybody being, you know, focused on getting results right away and not saying, oh, it'll take us three years to analyze what we want because as the sequence data comes off, uh, we want to start looking right away. So can you sort of speak to that problem of, of only a few people as opposed to a lot of people and how much it's going to take to transition to having many do it? Well, I mean, my, my sense is that it's incremental. So we'll, okay. there'll be... The, the exome sequencing that we do now is, is far from perfect. There's a number of, um, I mean, Peter, Peter can certainly testify to the fact that uh, small insertions and deletions are still called very badly, really, from, from exome data. But that's improving um, and will you know, we'll be much better in one year or two years' time. But at the moment, even with the data quality that we currently have, it's, it's still possible to use exome data in, in very careful ways to get, to get clean answers for specific questions. And in particular, in the, in the rare disease space, it's been incredibly effective, even though we know we're missing some variants. Um, so, so I see it as a, as, a, as a kind of incremental process. We will, there will be some low-hanging fruit that we can answer with existing methods. As we refine the methods and increase the, the complexity of the phenotype data and the accuracy with which we call sequence data, um, we'll be able to move higher up, higher up the tree to the, the higher hanging fruit. Um, but there's, I don't think there's a sense in which we need to wait. We can, we can get quick wins now with the methods we currently have, and then just it will incrementally progress from there. I'm still blown away by the, sh by the sheer volume of data and the complexity of handling the data. And you said these challenges will be solved, but do you have, can you speculate on how we avoid the truck and the save? Sorry, well, how, how, how we can avoid the, comp how, how will we handle these problems? Not to need a truck to, to, to Oh, I see, oh, the, the, data, the, the data transfer problem. Yes, yeah. that, that's, it's, it's a big problem. Um, so there, there are various, there's certainly a, a huge amount of effort currently underway in increasing bandwidth. Uh, uh, and uh, again, I, I think this is a problem that, you know, in, in a year or two potentially will we'll get fixed. And in, in other countries which have better uh, better underlying networks, it is actually to some extent solved. Um, but so is there a technological path forward, or does it need a disruptive technology before so we can do it? I, I, don't, I have to say this is a field I don't know incredibly well, but my understanding from, from speaking to people is that there is, there is a, a path that's being followed, and certainly there's a huge amount of investment currently being pushed into that, into that type of area. There's, there's, there's a lot of... I mean, genomics is just one area where moving lots of data around is important. Uh, there are there are areas that are far more commercially important where moving lots of data around is is critical. So I think that's that will drive um, that will drive innovation pretty rapidly. But, but I think for the project, the kind of project we are talking about here, this is very relevant to think about. It's, it, it's, it's it's probably worth adding that it's, it's the raw sequence data, that's, which is That's huge. absolutely right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Most users would be happy with it, just exactly. variant calls, yes. and then much, much smaller files. That, that's right, and that, yeah, Peter's hit the critical point. So, so this, this initial, uh, the, the truck that we have to drive across the country is only for that raw data that then needs to be processed into analytical records that are much easier to move. So in the context of the Thousand Genomes Project, very few people would download the raw sequence data from that project, but there's been very wide utilisation of the variant calls that have emerged from it, which are... Uh, you know, a file that's a you know a, f a few gigs or a, or a couple of hundreds of gigs. Yeah. And then Gail. 
Yeah, you told us last night to start worrying about the multiple comparisons on the phenotype side, so I did. Um, I, maybe, here's a question, maybe it's not as bad as it looks at first blush, because at least on the phenotype side, if you think of all of the conditions we have discussed this morning, it's not like a SNP here and a SNP there. There are relationships. So don't you think that if we use um, family-wise approaches and hierarchical, that we, it's not, it's not going to be an overwhelming problem? <clears throat> a disorder of a heart is related to another disorder of a heart more sure. so than to an eye. So, yeah, so uh, are you really absolutely. scared? Because it, it seems to me a tractable problem. Well, it, it depends on what we think. So there will, there's certainly co many correlations between these phenotypes. So a, a, an appropriate correction method will take into account that correlation structure. And it, it's, it's not as though we'll suddenly be doing, you know, this stringent bond for any correction across every possible phenotype that we look at. But even so, I think human, humans are just fundamentally incredibly complex creatures. And we have, there are, there are just lots of different things going on with us that, that need to be measured and that, that aren't necessarily all just aspects of, of just a few different fundamental phenotypes. So I think, uh, particularly as we start thinking about things like longitudinal RNA sequencing data or metagenomic data, these very complex data sets that in, in and of themselves constitute many, many different measurements, that, that's where multiple testing starts to spiral out of control incredibly quickly. That's so, and again, it's, it's not, it's not intractable. It just means it will be it will be very hard to use these these cohorts for discovery, but they will still be incredibly powerful from a validation perspective and from going in and saying, I have found a variant in another cohort that I think is associated. What is the what is it, what is an unbiased estimate of the effect size of that variant? Then you can use, that's where these cohorts are incredibly useful. I do, yeah. Uh, I could go on a great length, but I won't. I'll try and be brief. There's a lot of muddle thinking about multiple testing. Um, I, my own view is that the kind of classical statistical way of thinking about it is uh, for many purposes misguided, but in this specific discussion, it just seems bonkers to me that if we've got genome-wide data on some individuals and I'm doing a study on heart disease as a phenotype and Rick is doing a study on some cancer as a phenotype, that somehow or other the fact that he's doing a study means that I have to use different p-value thresholds is completely bonkers. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a real danger that we'll get them, let the multiple comparison uh, tail wag the dog and so on. Daniel, thanks. It was a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could address what are the current limitations of sequencing that we should really care about, like HLA or trinucleotide repeats, and what, you know, whether some of those things are going to get fixed, what's unfixable, what's the timeline? Um, so HLA is, is a nightmarish region of the genome that uh, most of us try not to venture into if we can avoid it. But, there, but there, are, there are certainly people working on it. There are particular regions of the genome that are nasty, and um, in some cases, I think those will be, there will be methods that are developed, particularly improving the reference, the reference sequence, that will make them a bit more tractable. In other cases, there are regions that are just so repetitive that with the current length of reads, it will be impossible to sequence through those. There are particular classes of variants that we're still not very good at calling, so small insertions and deletions are still a challenge, uh, particularly in the, in the medium range. That is definitely tractable. So the, in fact, I, th I think we now understand to a much better extent the causes of the problem, and it, there's a there's an issue associated with poor modelling of the errors that are, that occur there. Uh, that that I expect, I, I'd be interested to get Peter's take on this, but uh, but I expect that we'll be doing far better on calling of small indels in the next six six months to twelve months. Absolutely. And then there are there are other more complex classes, larger uh, insertions and deletions. We're still not very good at, but but again, I think those those will improve with longer reads and better technology and, and some algorithmic improvements. So HLA is sort of important for us. So I'm curious. Sure. <laughs> Besides the not wanting to venture in part. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you know, what sure. are there potential solutions to that region? So I, I don't know. Basically, because I've tried to to avoid looking at it, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But, there, but, but, there, I, but I know there are people working tough. on it. Yeah. It, it. It's tough. I mean, you need very long reads, and even that doesn't really help. I mean, we've been doing some 454 sequencing just in HLAB, and it's really very, very messy. I think, you know, PacBio or one of these much longer read single cell technologies is really what we're going to need, and those aren't ready for prime time yet. You can't do it with SNPs, and you can't do it with short reads. You can't make sense of B and C. So my suggestion is the HLA people get together at the break. <laughs> so, so thank you, Daniel. And you could pass the uh, slide exchanger to the left. And our next speaker is Nancy Cox, who's